some stuff like this. Okay, 40 years ago. Today is uh, June 25th, 2017. Welcome to the Berean Bible Fellowship. Today's sermon is titled, What is the Object of Your Faith? What do I mean by that? We mean, what is the focus of your faith? What is it that you believe in? As Christians today, we must listen to questions like, how can you have blind faith in God? Have you ever heard that one before? They talk about your faith and they said it's just blind. There's no proof, you can't see it. How can you believe in that which you can't see? Or we get, do you really believe in an all-powerful, all-known being? They try to shame you. They try to make you think, think like, you're, you're an idiot. Yeah. How can you actually believe in something? The question is that, that I have for those who don't believe in God is, if not God, what else? What else explains our creation? What else explains the intricate makeup of a, of a human body and all its inner workings and how, how the, the head works well with the heart and they, they interact with each other and everything keeps it in equal balance? Did this all just come up out of nowhere? So if not God, what else? Many take the scientific or the philosophical approach to describe how creation came into existence. The similarities that we all share is we all place our faith in something. Okay? Webster's yeah. Dictionary defines faith as strong belief or trust in someone or something. <laughs> then it goes on and says, belief in the existence of God, strong religious feelings or beliefs. A system of religious beliefs. In the Bible, faith is defined in Hebrews 11.1. It says, now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance about we do what we do not see. So you have to accept when truth comes to you and you have to believe it. When in fact, we put our faith in many different things. We put our faith in the wisdom of men, in philosophy. Philosophy is defined as the study of basic ideals about knowledge, truth, right and wrong, religion, and the nature and the meaning of life. The problem with philosophy is its base is in man, which is something that is imperfect. So it's man telling you what they think about truth, what they think about knowledge, what they think about wisdom. And what does the Bible say about the wisdom of man? That it's foolishness. Okay? So, another place we put our faith is we put it in the sciences. Evolution, the Big Bang Theory. Sometimes we put our faith in commentaries. We, we sit there, we, we believe in the Bible. But we want to go to the commentaries to explain what the Bible says. And that's just man's interpretation of what is there. God has broken the Bible down so each and every one of us can, can understand it. We just have to apply ourselves. Yet, what is God's opinion of the wisdom of man? And as I said, in 1 Corinthians 3.19, Paul writes, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. But it is not just the major areas in the search of truth and light where we exercise faith. Faith is practiced in our everyday lives. Think about prescription drugs. When you sit there and you go to the, to, the, uh, to the pharmacist and you have a prescription, the doctor's written now for you to take 25 milligrams of cardizin. You give it back to a pharmacist who takes it in the back. He sits there and he fills the drug. He gives it to you, you go home, and you take it without question. Now, I'm in the medical field. I've seen when the wrong drug is packed into the package. We had that happen with Alcas. Unfortunately, one of my nurses recognized the pill that it was wrong. Because we would have just given it, not thinking about it. All these different pills we give and everything. And who remembers this one? Who remembers this one? Fortunately, she remembered that one. 
members of that resident did not get the wrong medication. But we put our faith in that pharmacist and his abilities that he's going to give you the right medication. Where's another place that we put our faith? We went to Hershey Park last year, we, uh, or the year before. Myself, Ashley, Ashley's fiance. And they had about seven different roller coasters. I always have a saying about roller coasters. Somebody says, well, I, I, I think this roller coaster is safe, but I'm not getting on. <laughs> but if you have faith in that, in that roller coaster, you're going to get on. And we've seen some of the accidents that have happened with them. If they don't torque it to the proper, to the, to the proper adjustment, or this operator just knows us all. We've seen some horrible accidents happen. But still, we go every year to the state fair and all other places and we put our faith in these people and these rights. So that's another place that we put our faith. Me personally, I had a, went through a period where I like I like skydiving. <laughs> and uh Many times uh, when we talk about people's parachutes not open. And uh, they had after five jumps, they had to go through a jump school and teach you how to pack the shoe yourself. It's kind of like my brakes. I don't think I fixed my own brakes either. <laughs> so I, I didn't, but there again, you're putting your confidence in somebody else packing that shoot. And you're jumping 13,000 feet out, out of a plane. So you're putting your faith that that parachute's going to open and that this person packed that parachute right. And all of us have put faith in a relationship. And many of us have been hurt on that. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is de deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and no but knowing that, we still plunge head first right into a relationship. Putting our faith, all our belief and trust into another person, another sinful being. My wife doesn't like GPS, a uh, GPS. The GPS is kind of like, it's kind of like God. That it's going to give you directions, you have to have trust in it and follow it. Now, Raquel doesn't like the GPS, and she's actually gotten lost trying to listen to one because she doesn't trust it. So it tells her to turn right. She doesn't trust that she should be turning right. I know the way here. This isn't, this isn't the way. But the GPS, like God, knows what's ahead. It knows that there's construction on 690, and you're not going to be able to go that way, so it's re-diverting you another direction. So if you don't put your trust in that GPS, it doesn't work. And if you don't put your trust in God's work, God's word is not going to work for you. Because you're going to reject it. Just as Raquel rejects the directions of the GPS. <laughs> it's funny, you heard I were having breakfast this morning and I saw an ad on the TV and it was talking about driverless cars, how close we are. And they, they actually have a factory in Western New York that's working on that technology. It says, we're going to have driverless cars soon. And I turned around to Raquel, I said, would you trust a driverless car? And then I, right like the joint was coming off my lips, I said, well, trust a GPS, you're not going to trust the driverless car. <laughs> and she was like, no. She says, that thing would take me someplace where I'm going to get kidnapped or something. <laughs> So, so we exhibit faith in many different areas of our life. But it's a question of where what we're putting our faith in. Is what we're putting our faith in in Babylon? Is it science? Is it philosophy? Is it man? These are just a couple of examples of everyday life and activities where we put our faith in man and the equipment trusting that they will perform with integrity and proficiency. Let's more closely examine one of the, some of the given examples. In philosophy, Friedrich Nietzsche, I'm sure everybody's heard of Nietzsche. He was a, he was a philosopher from 1844 to 1900, uh, from Germany, he was a German philosopher, and a cultural critic 
who published it extensively in the 1870s to 1880s. And he's more famous for the uncompromising criticism of traditional European morality and religion, as well as conventional philosophical ideals and social and political pieties or ideals associated with modern reality, with things that are modern. Many of these criticisms rely on philosophical diagnoses that expose false consciousness infecting people's received ideals. In other words, the cultural norms. Back then, you had, it was, a, it was a very religious culture. Ideals in the culture were formed by the word of God. Nishi fought against that, and, and he attacked uh, religion. So, so for that reason, he is, he is often associated with a group of late modern thinkers such as Marx and Freud, who advanced the hermeneutics of suspicion. In other words, being suspicious of all cultural norms. Against traditional values, and also, Nietzsche also used his philosophical analysis to support original theories about the nature of the self and the provocative proposals suggesting new values that he thought would promote cultural renewal and improve social and physiological life of comparison to life under the traditional values criticized. Now, of course, I didn't write that. <laughs> I was reading off something. But to break that down, he, he went, he was counterculture. So he, he tried to, whatever ideals that we had, the culture had, he attacked and tried to give you an alternative. So first, he, he, what he did is a, a, creation of, a creation of suspicion to the accepted norms. Second, he redefined truth. Third, criticism of religion, for God and traditional values. Now, this isn't a new strategy. It was utilized right from the beginning. Turn with me to Genesis 3, chapter 3. Muslims that are out there, trust me, they know their scriptures. 
they're, they're taught to memorize their scriptures. So when you show weakness that you're not sure, you show your vulnerable, as Eve showed she was vulnerable here. Because she added to what God told her. God didn't tell her that she couldn't touch it. He said, don't eat of the food. So in verse 4 it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So here's where the lie comes in. The redefinition of truth. Satan gave Eve an alternative. He said, God has lied to you. He didn't tell you the truth. He said you're going to die. You're not going to die. Okay? And in Genesis 2, 17, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what God's instructions to Adam were. And in the original Hebrew, it actually says, Dying, thy shalt surely die. And I was confused on that before, because I couldn't find it in the Bible. And I was always taught that that's what its meaning was, dying, thy shalt surely die. And then I was looking for myself, and I didn't see that, that it said that. It says that in the original Hebrew. It, it repeats the, uh, the verb to die, and in repeating it, 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 it puts an emphasis on it. So he's saying, as you're dying, you shall surely die. So the moment that they ate of that fruit, the process of dying began. Amen. They were, sin was introduced, and exactly what God said would happen, happened. Okay? So let's take a look at a couple of points. The servant redefines truth, and he calls God a liar. Make no mistake, when people are redefining the truths of the Bible, they are calling God a liar. So when people today tell you that your children, tell, tell, tell you and our children, that there is no male and there is no female, they're deceiving you and they're calling God a liar. When they tell you that it's okay for a woman to be in a sexual relationship with another woman, they are calling God a liar. When they tell you that creation came from an explosion of nothingness, they again are calling God a liar. And when they, and when that they tell you that God didn't send His only Son to die for the sins of the world, they are calling God a liar. The serpent redefined truth, and those who pres presently hate God are trying to redefine truth. A child is best raised by a two-parent male and female family. God created the world, not the Big Bang Theory. God created a woman to procreate with a man. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and it dwelt among us. This is truth. Anything else is a deception. Verse 5 says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. The serpent criticizes God, telling Eve that, that is, this is why God lied to you, because he didn't want you to be like him. God desired for us to know only good. So have you been hurt? Have you been abandoned by parents? Have you lost a child? Have you been cheated on in a relationship? Have you been denied opportunity or discriminated against? Have you cried out, why me, God? Why am I going through this? It was never God's desire for you to know evil. With the introduction of sin into creation came evil and death. And in 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Eve accepted the lie. 
She looked at the fruit and she forgot what God told her and she accepted what the serpent told her. It was good for food. It was going to make her wise. Everything that God told her got pushed out of the way. How often do we do that? We forget the scriptures, we forget what we learn, and we start believing what is out here in this world. You need to believe the truth. You need to believe what God's word says. You need to stay on God's path. Amen. Don't believe the deception. Today, people are calling evil good and good evil. Also, she thought that going against God would make her wise. So going along with earthly wisdom, you'll be proven a fool and it will leave you empty every time. Just like the philosophers and, the, and just like those changing society today, they try to reinterpret or redefine what God says is right and wrong. If you open your mouth about God and truth, you are attacked. Verse 7 says, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they so fit leaves together and made themselves angels. Next and last, we will have a brief discussion about the theory of evolution. Because when you ask the question, if not God, then what? In many cases, the answer will be evolution. I always found that the theory of evolution to be quite laughably entertaining because I marvel at how far people are willing to go to deny the existence of the one true God. The theory of evolution is not only ridiculous, but it violates the laws of science that the founders of the theory aspire to. Examples are the three laws of thermodynamics that is widely accepted by all that call themselves scientists. Now the first law basically says that energy or matter can neither be created nor destroyed. In terms of machines, this has meant that total energy output, output work by the machine is equal to the heat supply. In other words, the change in the internal energy of a closed system is equal to the heat added to the system minus the work done by the system. Because the system operates in the real world, some energy always escapes into the outside world, thus leading to both efficiency in the second law, which is generated to cover the so-called flaw in the first law. Let me break that down into English. <laughs> you don't get something from nothing. In order to have energy output, the equal amount of energy has to be input. So you don't get a creation of energy from nothing. The Big Bang Theory says that there was nothing, complete nothingness. And from complete nothingness, you had a big explosion. What exploded? What exploded? There was nothing. There was no energy. There was nothing. And from this nothingness, you got this huge explosion that created the whole universe. Now, we've all seen explosions. We've seen pictures of the atomic bomb going off. We've seen uh, stars bursting out in heaven. We've seen all kinds of different explosions. TNT. Has anybody ever seen an explosion go off and after the, the dust clears, a house is standing there? No. Have you ever seen something explode, force it going outward, and it suck things back together? No, you haven't. Now, one of the one of the, the theories that things in science is that science has to be repeatable. In other words, you got to be able to do it again. I haven't seen any worlds forming in front of me out of nothing. I haven't seen any apes turning into human beings. Now, granted, you've got some ugly brothers out there, okay, that look like they could be a missing link, but they're not, okay. Joe Frazier was one. We often we used to wonder. Ollie called him the gorilla in Manila. So, so I have a question accuracy of this theory. So do you have the faith to believe that nothing 
came with. But said nothing came, everything came from nothing. Because if you do, you're the one with blind faith. Yeah. Okay? You just believe uh, if you, these theories that have no proof, that have no basis. And even the scientists who've come up with these theories in the back rooms whisper, we know this isn't really how it is. <laughs> but they just don't want to admit that there is an almighty God. And they will go to unbelievable lengths to sit there and to deceive and to argue. Amen. So if you accept that something came from nothing, why is it not repeated? One other, one other uh, theory that was quite interesting that they have is the theory of the sun. And the sun shrinks about five feet every year. It's, 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 a, it's a fireball. Every hour. Every hour, okay. Every hour, it shrinks five feet. If you were to add millions of years onto the sun, the earth never would have existed. But they need millions of years for their theory of evolution to work. So they, there has to be millions of years. And I was researching this theory when I was doing this, and they have another theory that says it doesn't actually shrink that amount, that it shrinks, but then there's reactions going on inside that cause it to expand again. So it shrinks, it expands, it shrinks, it expands. That's what's called circular reasoning. In circular reasoning, we would sit there and say, Spam is the best tasting meat in the world because Spam tastes great. I sat there and I made a statement and I took you right back around to it. I had not proven anything. And that's exactly what they did. They said the sun doesn't shrink. It, it fluctuates on the inside so it doesn't shrink. <laughs> so you've just, you've just come up with something that you can't prove to prove something that you can't prove. Yes. Re redefinition of truth. That's what it is. Because for a long time they've known the sun is shrinking. And things that burn shrink. <laughs> They're consumed. And when something's being consumed, it doesn't build more from nothing. But that goes along with their theory of evolution, something from nothing. So in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And that is how the world was created. This is true. This is where our faith rests and will be fulfilled. Anything else is a deceptive alternative to the truth, which yields the consequence of death. God gives revelation over an expanded period of time. We as human, impatient human beings, we want everything and we want it now. We want to pray and we want that prayer answered now. Why can't you deliver me now <laughs> from this pain that I'm in? God has a way of revealing as nature reveals slowly and in its time. I was using the example this morning that we're like a cake that's in the oven and we're not quite done yet. God's not going to take the cake out before it's done. Because when you take a cake out uh, before it's done, when you set it on the counter, you know what happens to it? It collapses. Center collapses because it's not done yet. And God takes us through the fuck. Wait. You explained that God created light first, then the sun days later? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Go to Genesis there. And let's see, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And you know, and, and that light was the light of God. It was the light of God. And it's then said, God created, several days later, created the, the actual sun. So, and, and in the end time, not the end times, but when, when we are in heavenly places and the nation of Israel is in the, in the, after the thousand year reign, the new Jerusalem comes down, the light of God is what will light the world. So again, 
there will be no sun. It will be the light of God that lights the world. He is the light of the world. Amen. So as I was saying, Paul, Paul received his revelation over 14 years. God just didn't dump it all on him all at once. And we can't, we can't, we can't handle the revelation like that. The revelation that God has to give to us all at once. He's going to give it to you a little bit at a time. So when you're receiving the calling of God, when He's calling you and telling you that He, that he wants to uh, enlighten you, you have to respond. When you receive truth, you have to respond. Amen. You have to respond positively because you can respond positively or you can respond negatively. You can say, no, I reject this. I don't believe that this is God's word. But what are you using as your source? You have to use the word God as your source. And just like my wife with the GPS, we have to trust that this is the way. That this is what's going to lead us and guide us to truth. Because if we don't, when it turns us to turn, tells us to turn right, we're not going to want to turn right. And what happens then? You miss the road. You miss the road and you miss reward. And you hope, you hope that you get the gospel right. Many don't. And many don't. On the back of your program here is the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 6. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. The Gospel is that you must believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is how we're saved during the age of grace. Amen. By, by the Apostle Paul. Not saved by him. Saved by his gospel. We're saved by Christ. And his sacrifice. Amen. 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 Alright. So if there are no questions. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. We want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your word Father. Help us to. Incorporate your word, Father, into our daily activities. Help us to be ambassadors for Christ, Father, carrying your gospel out into the world. Preaching, teaching, Father, in these end times, Father, giving, giving the call that, that many will answer, Father. Use us as your tools as, as, to help guide those to, to the truth. Father, spread our ministry throughout Syracuse, Father, and help us to reach, reach many people who are lost. In all these things, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Amen.